iSelect Fund is not soliciting investment or providing investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. iSelect is a venture capital firm in St. Louis focused on companies in food, agriculture, and health. iSelect invests at the forefront of innovation, seeking emerging problems, solutions, and technologies. iSelect uses these deep dive presentations not only as a way to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who drive and change innovation in their respective fields. Welcome to iSelect's Deep Dive uh, series. My name is David Yoakum. You may have seen me on uh, a handful of these uh, in the past. I'm a principal here on the iSelect uh, investment team. I'm excited to walk, walk you through our discussion today and our, and our deep dive. One thing that we've been researching is nutrient density uh, in the food system. And we'll explore what that, the definition or the definitions of, of nutrient density. But just to sort of set the stage, contrary to what we see on the surface, uh, food can vary widely uh, in terms of how much how rich and how diverse nutrients are um, in that food uh, complex. Variables including how a product is bred, how and where it's produced, how it's transported, and how it's prepared can all have a significant impact on how nutritious the product actually makes its way onto our mouths. Um, historically, it's been extremely challenging, expensive um, to measure nutrient density effectively, um, making much of this information inaccessible today. However, that's changing uh, and emerging tools and technologies and initiatives um, are making it easier to measure and understand what is actually in our food and what drives better nutrition um, in the food system. So in today's deep dive, we're going to explore the drivers of nutrient density. Um, we're going to explore some of the emerging technologies to help measure it um, and some of the business models and opportunities that may emerge once we have this data available to us. So I'm going to sort of set the um, agenda for today. Um, we're going to start off with some speaker introductions. Um, we're going to talk a little about nutrient density. I'm going to walk through a key definition of nutrient density. We're going to talk through some of the core issues, and we're going to bring in some of this expert perspective um, from the innovators we have on the call today, and we'll save some time for the questions um, at the end. But with that, I'd love to start off with some brief introductions. Eric, if we could start with you, then go with Bruce, and then Paul, that'd be fantastic. Hey, everyone. Um, excuse me. Thanks for joining today. Uh, it's great to be here with the iSelect team. Been following them for years. Um, I am uh, co-founder and CEO of Edacious. Uh, at Edacious, we're uh, looking to bring nutrition data to life. We're working to solve two problems, which is one, driving down the cost of measuring nutrition, and then two, translating that information so that the nutritional composition of food can be benchmarked uh, so that we understand relative quality. Um, my background is uh, actually in venture capital. I uh, spent the past five years uh, driving a portfolio called Neglected Climate Opportunities with the Grantham Foundation as an early stage catalytic climate investor. Um, we helped to seed the, the landscape um, in terms of carbon removal and across the food and ag system. Uh, prior to that, just been in the environmental finance and sustainability space, uh, working to connect dots. I actually I worked in certification for a long time and been trying to figure out how to properly manage outcomes. And that's what brought me to the world of nutrition. Amazing. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Bruce? Yeah, also delighted to be here. Uh, I'm the academic geek on this <laughs> panel. Um, I'm a professor at the University of California, Davis. Uh, I direct the Foods for Health Institute. Uh, and we basically have asked evolution uh, how to nourish uh, humans. Uh, we study lactation biology and how milk influences the success of, uh, of breastfed infants. Uh, we've taken the discoveries we've made scientifically into various um, ventures where, where we thought appropriate uh, as, as venture. Uh, I'm also senior advisor to the Periodic Table of Foods Initiative, uh, a very bold and ambitious initiative uh, out of the Rockefeller Foundation uh, to, to begin to build the complete and comprehensive database of food composition around the world. Wonderful. Thanks, Bruce. And uh, last but not least, Paul. Hey, guys. Paul Grieve, token farmer on the panel. Uh, started out as a college athlete and then uh, went into the Marine Corps and caught Lyme disease during sniper school. Um, that kind of led me down the food path, um, studying food and trying to source better food. Started a little tiny small farm in our backyard in Southern California. Um, finished my MBA and worked as a CPA for a while, also in the venture industry. Uh, we raised some money and uh, spun up a, a company called PastureBird that built some, some really unique technology about how to move large flocks of chickens to fresh pasture every day. 
um, and we sold that to Purdue Foods back in 2019, um, and I'm continuing to help out there. So that's a little background. Excited Wonderful. to excited to chat today. Awesome, thanks, Paul. And and if you're curious to know what Paul's uh, operation looks like at Pasture you can just look at his screen and the direct background that's recording in the background. Um, uh, really awesome. Excited to hear him talk more about that today. All righty. Well, um, I'm going to speak here briefly, and then we're going to bring in some of the speaker um, involvement um, and get some of this expert opinion. Um, but sort of setting the stage, I want to talk a little bit about ways to frame thinking about nutrient density and sort of how we think about that in the context of what we're focused on here at Isolite. Um, so I want to draw your attention initially to this, this left side and sort of these three systems um, uh, that we talk about here. Uh, we talk about system A, system B, and system C when we think about food systems. And it's it's reflective of what has happened in the last hundred years, um, particularly um, in the food system, um, moving through the green revolution uh, and the way in which yield absolutely exploded across the world. Um, but that not that nutrition didn't necessarily follow uh, in the same in the same way. And so the way we think about this is that initially there's a food system called food system A um, that is focused on plentiful and cheap. Um, food, but is not necessarily high in nutrition. Um, then we think about food system B, which is really focused on high quality produce, high quality meat products, um, ultimately products that are that do embody what we think about nutrient density, but that those products are really only available to a small portion of the population. Um, that may be due to geographic limitations. That also may be due to socioeconomic um, limitations and other structural barriers that keep people uh, from consuming high quality, fresh, nutritious foods. Um, that's food system B. It's nutritious, but it's not plentiful and it's not accessible. Then we think about this sort of future vision of a food system C, and food system C is really focused around food that is nutritious, plentiful, cheap, and I'll also throw in sustainable. Um, it's food that gets produced within the broader, more ecological sense of how food should be produced um, and less of, a, of an industrial focus around food, but combining the concepts of yield and the concepts of nutrition into one. And so there's a lot of different companies that we've invested in that we're working toward here going forward that are chipping away at the solutions that will become a part of that future vision of system C. Now, within that, there's an important concept, which is thinking about nutrient density. And I think there's a lot of different um, definitions. And I think I emailed er with Eric a little bit about this in terms of how they're also thinking about defining um, nutrient density. I think there are a few different ways of thinking about it through reading a few de different definitions and just doing some background research. Though, Ultimately, what I what I think it boils down to is thinking about the quality, quantity, and the diversity of healthy nutrients that are found in a food, um, a food product, or a combination of foods um, that are that are consumed in, in the course of a meal. Um, I think you can't just have one of those. If you have just quality but a low quantity, uh, it may not really have a, a you know a health impact that's meaningful. If you have just quantity but not quality, then you're not really getting any nutritional benefits. And if you don't have diversity, um, you, you may just be getting a lot of one nutrient and not a lot of the other ones that may be important to a functioning body um, in, a, in a functioning life. Um, that being said, this is sort of my, my definition of how I've been thinking about nutrient density in the, in the way that I want to frame the conversation today. But Eric, I know you spent a lot of time thinking about this core definition. I don't know if there's anything else that you would want to add in terms of how you guys are thinking about the, the real definition of nutrient density before we sort of move into why, why this matters. Yeah, I should I should kick it over, Bruce, <laughs> and so let the academic speak before before I offer my own insights. But I think the point is is that it is undefined, and that is the problem. Uh, just yeah. like regenerative, what does that mean? Um, so I think there's been historically a one definition, which is the concentration of nutrients per a unit of energy, and that's well thought out. But what that really has focused on is apples to bananas comparisons between food right. and really hasn't allowed for depth in apples to apples comparisons, which is where we're all trying to head. Um, the two communities that have seen, traditionally sought to define it has been academia and that has been all over the board. So there's a lot of great papers that have proposed different systems with different frameworks. The next evolution has been nutrient profiling systems, which I think are doing a much better job because they're actually taking a quantitative approach to it. Um, the dietary guidelines of the Americas, they have sought to define it, but without any quantification. So again, you're seeing, uh, the, the, the preponderance of views on nutrient density has led to where we are today, which is no one can make apples to apples comparisons, which right. is what 
we're, we're going to solve. So Absolutely. I'll take it over to Bruce. I'd love to hear his thoughts. Yeah, actually, um, I highly recommend anyone go on Eric's company's website to look at the description of, of what calories have done to the food supply. Um, historically, uh, foods were actually low in calories and high in nutrients. Um, with modern agriculture and the ability to formulate foods, uh, one of the things that has been very successful uh, is, is simple calories. Uh, we have to get all of our essential nutrients every day, and we have to do that in this food supply that provides the number of calories we need, no more and no less. That's extremely difficult to do. It's yeah. even more difficult when there are some foods in the marketplace, especially for uh, serving an uneducated and, and, and low socioeconomic sector that are almost pure calories. And if you consume 1500 calories as, uh, as, as empty uh, starch, sugar, fat, um, you're gonna have to make all your nutrients in a tiny subset of, uh, of the rest of your diet. And it's practically impossible to do that. So we really need to start thinking about exactly as, as Eric suggests, how do we get a comprehensive view of nutrition, making sure that we do that without excessive calories. Got a really good point. Thanks, Bruce. And hopefully that gives anybody listening a good, a good, a good sense of sort of the, the framework of how we're going to be talking about nutrient density today. Um, with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about sort of why it matters. And there's there's multiple reasons why this matters. Um, these are just a handful of of, of components to this. Um, you know, I think in some ways, framing nutrient density, there's a little bit we don't know what we don't know in that it's been really challenging to measure this to date. So it's a little hard to know exactly what some of the consequences have been. But initially, there are some areas in which it can have a lot of relevance. One is that um, there is documented micronutrient deficiency in the US and globally um, in different quantities in different parts of the world for people consuming different diets. Now, I think I think we lost you there, David. Yeah, I'm not hearing him either. Yeah, he looks good, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I can I can jump in for him there and yeah, go for that it. point. But um, what, what's fascinating about the micronutrient deficiencies is we actually don't even have the underlying data to say whether or not those deficiencies, the extent to which those deficiencies are real uh, or even worse than we think. And that is all based on uh, NHANES and, and uh, U US data sets that are poorly understood and calculated because we don't have the underlying data of what's actually in the food to begin with. Um, and we lost the <laughs> presentation uh, too. <laughs> Um, the second we're picture taking there, over. We're taking over. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone from the iSelect team? There we go. Hey, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, it looks like my internet decided to uh, throw in a fun technical difficulty. Um, fortunately, it's not the first time that's happened in my life. So uh, can you guys hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah, you're good. And don't worry. Eric just picked up the baton and slayed the micronutrient deficiency <laughs> bullet. So you're Thank good. You. Thank you. Well, that's super helpful. Um, I am sorry I missed it. But I'll look forward to hearing hearing the bullet points on the uh, on the recorded side. Um, so moving moving beyond micronutrients, um, I think one of the challenges and this is this sort of centerpiece in the data I'm about to share is, is really just around calories. But you know, it's well understood that you know, caloric content on food labeling can vary by at least 20% uh, on the on the top end or the bottom end. Uh, I think it's safe to say that that's also true for the variety of other nutrients that are um, listed as in a food product. Um, and part of that's around measurement challenges. And the other part of that is around the level of granularity you want to get to. And this is going to relate to a slide that I'm going to show on pasture bird in, in the future. But there's a lot of micronutrients that we understand today or may come to understand more in the future that may play a very vital role in certain health functions that aren't even listed on some of these food products that could be proven to be extremely important. 
And I think that's just another component of the we don't know, we don't know piece. Like it's not just about fat. It's not just about calories and carbohydrates. There's a lot of other components that are really important when we think about what it means to really have a healthy diet that is truly nutrient dense. And it's beyond um, the items that we can see here listed on this, uh, on this yogurt cup. Can I yeah. add a quick anecdote to that, David? Yeah, please. I learned um, recently that the last time they checked the nutritional facts panel for poultry was in 1990. So you wow. can imagine how much has likely changed um, since then. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, it's, um, it, it is amazing when you think about how out, outdated some of these things are, but that how uninformed the consumer is generally about what those updates are and, and that it can be really opaque about what some of this information really means and how to think about it, which I think is why nutrition is often viewed so much as a pseudoscience and often viewed so much as, as confusing for so many people. I mean, I, I, I run through this a lot. I run a, I run a fitness community in San Francisco and a lot of people, their biggest questions are how do I eat healthy? What things should I do to eat healthy? Right. And um, it's amazing, like with all the information that's out there today, how much true confusion there still really is about what that means and different takes on, on going after that. Um, the, la the last piece that I want to highlight here is thinking about the relationship between nutrient density and the climate impact of the food system. And I, I think this is an interesting point and it's something that Eric has, I've heard Eric speak to many times um, through his, career, his work at Edacious. I think on the surface, it's not abundantly uh, clear to someone necessarily that there's a relationship between why nutrient density and nutrition matters as it pertains to the impact of the food system on climate change and the food system on the environment. Eric, do you want to speak a little bit to sort of what that relationship is and how you guys think about that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, this is key. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, I was in climate uh, venture and climate investments for the past five years. And so I was really just asking myself, what is the connecting thread between climate, agriculture, and human health? And what are the actual mechanisms to pull regenerative agriculture through the food system as a climate solution? Because just paying farmers for the value-added services around ecosystem services was going to be an immense challenge. And it wasn't the primary thing that they were producing. They are producing food. Um, so in terms of trying to connect the dots between the climate impact of our food and the nutritional composition of the food, if we have a good link to show best management practices that are mitigating excess greenhouse gases, sequestering carbon, and establishing resiliency in those systems, we have a real tool for incentivizing behavior change at the farm level. And you have to do that through better tasting, higher quality food. And you know, Paul's a, a living, breathing example of that and working on that. Um, but it's it's really hard to get producers moving in that direction and and have actual data points to connect those dots. That's what Ignatius is trying to do. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really a really good point. I think there's it's an it's another lever in the tools toolbox that we have for incentivizing a, mo a move to practices that are ultimately better for the planet. Um, I always say you have um, we we just preach you know all the regenerative and i see a bunch of them in the in the um attendees list too but it's like we all preach soil organic matter and carbon sequestration and water holding and pass all this stuff and then what we get back from the consumers like a collective clark gable like frankly my dear i don't give a damn you know <laughs> um, we care a lot they don't care at all so um what they do care about though is feeding their kids the healthiest food that they possibly can so i think in my opinion it's the most important lever that we have to push forward regenerative egg yeah absolutely um, so the next piece that I want to talk about here is around drivers of nutrient density. And I want to preface it by saying that the drivers of nutrient density are still things that are being researched and explored. There's some data out there that's both academic. There's some data out there that's more anecdotal. Um, but there's sort of a general framework for understanding things that can be done to drive different nutritional outcomes in, in food production, uh, and then food consumption. So this is a, an equation that, um, that Eric, Eric has put forward um, in terms of thinking about some of the core principles. And I've added some of these uh, additional considerations on the right side. And so the, the real core drivers of nutrient density in terms of you know, the baseline, what a food product could be, and then the environment we put it in, how we, how we grow that product, ultimately drive an outcome that is the combination of yield and nutrition. So the genetics, um, whether or not these are bred, whether or not this might be a CRISPR product or a GMO product, 
Um, obviously, golden rice is an example of something where the genetics have been altered in order to drive a certain nutritional outcome um, is one piece of the puzzle in terms of saying, how can we make foods that are more nutrient dense or that have a, a specific desired nutrient outcome? Um, the second is obviously the environment, which can relate to the physical geography of where a product is produced, the soils that it's grown in, um, the climate, the local climate of where that, that product is produced. And then obviously the management practices, which may include, um, you know, traditional, more conventional agricultural practices that apply chemicals, uh, pesticides, herbicides, et cetera. They could be uh, more regenerative organic types of um, production methods that include um, no-till, low-till, um, cover cropping, um, a variety of other, other methods that can be used to preserve soil health in some way. All of these combinations um, end up driving the shift that we're it was, you think about going, at the system C view, this sort of future state of the world. Um, the other way that I've seen Eric uh, describe this equation is G times E times M equals nutrition instead of yield. I know that has shifted sort of being yield times nutrition, um, but it's about shifting away from that pure yield focus into looking at these drivers around how we, we can get to nutrition as well. I do want to just mention briefly um, around the additional um, factors is that you know, practically these are farm gate on the left side. These are, these are farm gate types of um, drivers, but other components matter too. It matters whether or not there's degradation of a product and its transportation. It matters whether or not there's degradation of a product's nutrient quality through processing, um, which certainly happens to a lot of food products that we consume today. You know, I think about whole fruit, whole fruits versus fruit juices, just as a great example of that, um, that I, there's been a lot more awareness around over the last five to 10 years. Um, that's something where you lose a lot of nutrient or you take nutrients out of context, um, and it causes a completely different metabolic and biological response in the human body. Um, and the last thing is obviously preparation, how food is produced, what it's, what it's consumed with. These are other factors that are more external and harder to control, um, but this is sort of the, the ways in which we might think about why we, why we would start to see so much variation, um, variation in terms of nutrient density, nutrient quality um in food products um eric i don't know if you want if you want to add anything or talk about sort of how you came to the conclusion around this sort of simple message between genetics environment and management maybe how you guys have observed that for some of your work at edacious yeah um well one first i you know i think it's incredible the amount of capital that we've poured into genetics and genetics are always going to be a driver and and there's no doubt about that and Good genetics and a good environment with the right management practices is going to deliver you the best results. But without good genetics, it doesn't matter how good your environment is, uh, you're, you're going to continue to get poor results. But historically, we've just focused on that part of the equation or the chemical synthetic paradigm that goes into act upon those genetics in that environment. And everything's been built around that system. So the yield above all paradigm based on calories is exactly how we've gotten to where we are. Again, no one's fault. That's what we designed for. That's what the intent of the USDA has been for the past 40, 50 years was maximizing caloric output and maximizing export of calories to developing countries. Uh, and we're here suffering as a result, both environmentally and our health because of those decisions. So to change that, we need to start measuring nutrition. And that's what we're here to talk about. Yep. The one thing I will add back to connecting the dots with climate Food waste is a huge problem and cannot be ignored. But the funny thing about food waste and nutrient density is the focus on yield has increased the number of carbohydrates in food. More carbohydrates is more sugar. More sugar is higher degradation. Less nutrients means things rot, decay, go bad a lot faster. And so you think about the food of your you know, you could put food in your uh, basement cellar and it would be good for a year because it had its own metabolic pathways for keeping itself intact. And now you put food out in shelf and those microbes and decay processes begin almost immediately because it's just sugar waiting to get consumed. Yeah, super good point. Um, so moving with these, with these drivers in mind, um, I want to walk through a couple examples of just um, certain outcomes that have been observed in the field. And, you know, one thing that I've talked to Eric about in the past is about just the amount of variance that can occur and, and the variance that they've seen in terms of measurement. So I, I, 
again, I want I want to explore this data with the lens that this is an evolving field that we're starting to see some signals of what these drivers can look like, but that there's a lot of factors to take into account here, including the ones that we have here on the screen. Um, this is some this is some data that that Eric shared with me um, from the study here in the bottom left corner, um, and it's comparing regeneratively grown um, pastured um, beef products with more traditional um, feedlot um, conventional beef products and compares the ratios of um, of essential of essential fatty acids um, that are associated with health, including ALA, EPA, DPA, DHA, um, which are all known to have um, beneficial uh, impacts on on cardiovascular health, um, uh, uh, brain health, um, and a variety of other factors. And we can see that there is some evidence here um, in this explicit study that there can be times at which these regenerative practices um, lead to um, significantly higher ratios of these products. Now, I would, I, I think Eric, I, I'd be curious to get your comment here, but I think we've seen also that for regenerative, the range can be very wide, right? As opposed to conventional, which is, you know, more narrow and makes sense that it's more narrow because we're dealing with a more industrialized conventional practice. Um, how do, how do you guys think about these types of results versus the types of results that might, might occur across the field with, with more measurement? Well, of course, it's going to be highly varied. I mean, you could have a regenerative ranch with, you know, raising grass-fed beef on 1% organic matter. It's just kind of getting started on this regenerative journey. Or you could have somebody that's doing it for 60, 70 years with 8% organic matter and a really nice wide variety of, you know, grasses and forbs for those cattle. So yeah. I think it's going to be really hard slapping regenerative on and thinking things are going to follow in some linear pathway because there's a big breadth of, of different production styles and systems out there that might, you know, qualify as regenerative. It doesn't yeah. mean we shouldn't try, but it's going to be hard. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, kudos to, you know, David Montgomery and Ann Bilk for, for starting some of the conversation and research that basically, you know, preliminary in the sense where they did pair trials, they, they gathered food from two different systems where genetics were controlled, similar environmental conditions, but totally different management practices and said, look, look at the differences you're getting. And they really helped uh, their book, what, what, what Your Food Aid is fantastic and highly recommended. Um, and that's where this data comes from. Uh, and it really just shows uh, what Paul is elucidating and showing um, that it, you can't generalize about the system because the results are gonna be highly variable no matter what the system. Um, the fact is, but nutrition is an objective measurement that we can all agree on and look at because it is uh, quantifiable. And so that's where we're trying to head. Um, the one thing I would say, um, uh, the Bionutrient Food Association with uh, Stefan Van Vliet at a Utah State um, work that we funded at Grantham, he's, their preliminary results are starting to come out and they've done a great job. But what they show is that variability on grass fed uh, looks like this yeah. and the variability on corn, you know, grain fed systems looks like this. So yeah. there's, there's grass fed systems that are producing a lower quality product than uh, a, a good old KFO. So um, you can't, you can't make these generalizations based on that, you know, yeah. certifications and management practices. Yeah. So, yeah. For, so with all, with all those in mind, I think but, but my, my takeaway is, is that there certainly can be outcomes that are outlier and really positive nutritional outcomes and but it but it does require us to measure, and we need to reduce those barriers to measurement, which which we're going to get to with um, with Eric and some of his work at Edacious, as well as Bruce's work with the periodic um, table of food initiative. I want to jump now to a slide that's on um, pasture bird, and I encourage anyone uh, after the fact to check out this LinkedIn post that Paul shared. Um, it might it might have been two or two or three months ago. I also encourage you just to follow Paul on LinkedIn because he has like super awesome um, LinkedIn posts and like posts cool videos and like is always like sharing like the real like practices that they're undertaking at um at pasture bird but 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 paul you guys actually went through the the exercise of comparing barn it's interesting in the context of you talking about the nutritional guidelines that were put out in like 1990 for poultry and then you guys doing an updated study i guess there's a lot of information here i think the the main ways that i want to think about this is one how did you guys go about exploring this for anybody else out there who might want to ask these types of questions what did that process look like 
And when you got the feedback back, how how did you start to think about how you're going to use this information? Because it's really interesting. It's super valuable. It's meaningful nutritionally, but it's also potentially super confusing and beyond the scope of how a lot of people right now think about, about poultry, which I think most people look at poultry and they go, okay, it's, it's low in saturated fat mm-hmm. and it's high in protein. Um, and ultimately it's a lean protein, something I feel good about feeding my kids, but there's a lot more to it than that. So help us understand how you guys went about understanding this and how you're thinking about using that information. Yeah. I mean, I'll answer the first one first. I don't know how to use it. Like I, I'm literally, it's the million dollar question right now. Cause I'm half farmer, half marketer. And you get all this great data back and it's like, well, this is too much for most people <laughs> to really care about. So how, how do we wrap this up? What things do I even test? What matters to people? You know, everybody knows about omegas. Very few people want to talk about NADH, like their eyes kind of start to glass over. So I don't know yet how to talk about this stuff or how to roll it up or how to kind of explain it in a succinct way. The way that we went about it was um, we pulled six samples um, from six different flocks. So so um, 36 birds um, from our system across a, a full year so that we'd get all the different seasonal variation and stuff like that. We pulled the same six samples on six different flocks um, from a just a standard kind of barn raised um, really common conventional system. Um, we sent it to HRI labs, which I thought was doing some really interesting work, um, testing all across, I think 2,500 different micronutrients and spectrums, a lot of stuff that I don't understand. And we had them um, um, test the white meat and we had them test the dark meat. And uh, these are just a really tiny sample of the results that we got back. I, I found it interesting, um, but again, going back to how do we communicate this to the consumer? I don't know yet. You know, I, I think that's what we're trying to figure yeah, out. Absolutely. Bruce, I saw you nodding a bit during some of what Paul was talking about there. Do you, do you have any, any commentary you want to add? Oh, yeah. It, it's wonderful to see Paul and his vision have already anticipated what the critical dimension that we have to add that basically is pe- periodic table of foods initiative as one of the initiatives going forward is we have to know what's in food. Um, it, it's just bizarre that in 2023, uh, we're, we're talking about building databases of what, what food is. Um, and I, I think we've seen already in, in the time today that the entire enterprise is based around agriculture push. The farmers grow, harvest commodities, they're processed into ingredients, they're formulated into products, packaged and put into the, the marketplace. Um, what we really need is a complementary approach with the consumer in mind. What is it that the consumer needs? Um, if you were to establish the consumer-driven approach, then all of the things that Paul has recognized as assets to his uh, agricultural practices could be matched to people for whom those components are valuable. Um, actually, the, the, the metaphor we use is, uh, is Google Maps. Very simple value proposition. Where am I now? Where would I like to be? How do I get there? And because of a magnificent digital database in the cloud of all the streets and roads and highways, it's possible for your simple computational device to interrogate that that database. Um, It knows where I am. I tell it where I want to go. And it uses that data to solve for for the trajectory of how I'm going to get there. Um, And of course, Google Maps has transformed the world. Um, Now, take the same approach to diet. What's my diet or what's my health status now? What would my, I like my health to be? How do I get there? Mm -hmm. And I would be able to access a database that would give me the metaphorical equivalent of all the components that should be in my diet in the appropriate amounts. Uh, Eric has already raised this issue. We are not quantitative in our data. As individuals, it's vital how much of everything we get. Once we have the data on which we can base that kind of computational solution, then we can solve for everyone's health aspiration, get everyone to where they want to be through diet. Now, it, once you complement the agricultural push with the consumer pull in knowledge space, 
then it will be a very different value proposition. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, it's you know, putting, putting all that into context, thinking about Paul's comments initially and your comments now, Bruce, it, I think it is both a, a very high value mission, but it's also a long-term vision. And we'll talk about what some of these opportunities look like, but the, you know, needing the consumer to understand all this information and to value this information and make purchasing decisions off this information is something that, you know, takes time and, and takes work and a lot of education. And I think we'll talk about what some of those needs are and where some of those gaps are. Um, so we've talked a lot about what, um, what nutrient density is, what some of those core drivers are, why we need it, um, and what some of the results can look like depending on which of those drivers are applied depending on the agricultural system. Now, what I want to highlight in this next piece is what some of those challenges are that exist today uh, in terms of really understanding understanding what nutrient density is, how we think about what molecular components make up food, and some of the challenges that have kept us from measuring and understanding this more quickly. Um, from there, we'll talk a little bit more about what we can do with that information in a little bit more depth. And you know, Eric's working with a lot of different customers around on um, these problems and the inf their interest in this information and how they might use that. Um, so I think uh, it would the way I want to frame this is how do we understand what food is, and that's really what PTFI is is working to solve. What is food, um, and how does that relate to uh, human health more broadly? And then Edacious, where we're thinking about we have these challenges around measurement, but if we could solve those measurement challenges to more rapidly, more easily characterize the molecular components of food. What can we do with that information in terms of driving both human health outcomes, but also better environmental outcomes from from agriculture? Um, so maybe Bruce, can you can you talk a little bit in more depth around what PTFI is building, what you guys have built so far, and sort of how you guys are actually going about building that molecular uh, characterization of of food products today? Sure. Yeah. I both Paul and Eric have, have hit on this already. We measure historically a tiny subset of, of the composition of foods with any accuracy, basically the essential nutrients, the vitamins, minerals uh, that are in your food supply without which you die. Those are necessary, but not sufficient to health. Mm. There are thousands of compounds in foods and we select from thousands of possible uh, food, food items around the world. Right now, there is no accurate quantitative database of what is in foods. The Periodic Table of Foods Initiative has an extraordinarily bold ambition to measure all components of all foods in the world. And, and that sounds like it's I mean, just literally impossible. However, once you decide that's the goal, then you go, go about the process in a very different way. So first, establish standard methodologies so every time you measure something in a lab anywhere in the world they verify that they are accurately measuring every component in it that right. requires a different approach to methodology that means that every lab that's running samples is running standards at the same time so that the accuracy uh, both quantitatively and qualitatively can be verified once that's in place you then start to disseminate that around the world. Those methods can now go into labs in every country in the world. Each lab is then building a database and feeding it into the larger publicly accessible database. So we are truly building a legacy database. It has to be all components and foods. That means you have to put all of the modern analytical tools available into this process. And the Periodic Table of Foods Initiative has worked with the instrument makers, the standard reagent makers, so that the industry associated with analytics is fully engaged. So yeah. we know we can do this and we can scale it. And then you have to do it everywhere in the world. That means the methodology has to be standardized and scalable as analytics. That is already going. The goal for, for year one to measure, establish the thousand foods around the world that people recognize as being the first generation. Uh, and then the goal for year one analytically 
is to measure them and yeah. you're on that trajectory. And then you just start scaling, broadening. Uh, and then once that database is in place, then, then enterprises like Paul's can then compare their specific products against the standards around the world. And all of a sudden now you see everything that we know about food becomes relevant. And we just continue to build from there. The computational ability to say, the people in this part of the world seem to be living unusually good lives. <laughs> is it about their diet that's doing that? Yeah. Right now, we have these broad generalizations, the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> what is it about the Mediterranean diet? Do I have to live on Crete and walk up mountains every day? <laughs> is that the secret? Why doesn't, why doesn't it hurt? I have to know. <laughs> Probably doesn't hurt. I think that's really what the periodic table of foods is after. Yeah. yeah. And just, uh, and Bruce, just to put one finer detail on it, in terms of the analytical methods you guys are using, these are primarily mass, spectro mass spectroscopy based, um, spectrometry based um, measurement tools. Yeah. It turns out that uh, while no one's been really paying attention, the field of analytical mass spectrometry has just revolutionized itself. Over the past two decades, it has become a spectacularly accurate and sensitive analytical platform. And you used to have to dedicate an entire wing of, of a, an academic facility to the instrumentation. Yeah. Now, the instrumentation has been so successfully miniaturized and troubleshot so that more and more labs around the world are capable of implementing state-of-the-art analytics everywhere. And that has to be done. We can't just limit it to the wealthy of, uh, of Berkeley, <laughs> we have to get everywhere with this knowledge. Yeah, well, maybe that's a maybe that's a good a good jumping off point for for Eric and maybe some of the problems that you guys are trying to solve. I mean, obviously that field has come a long way, but we're still seemingly very behind in terms of a lot of the core measurements, especially being able to do so rapidly on a per customer basis. I think some of what you know in a, in a call we had recently, you just talked about the customers you're working with, whether they be CPGs or producers, being like so curious about seeing this information because it's really been hard for them to get a hold of. So maybe if you just give a little a little bit of background on, on what you guys are building at Edacious and sort of the role that the tech that you're building plays in sort of the context of, of what Bruce has talked about here in terms of that molecular characterization. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. So um, I don't think, I think Bruce did a good job of, uh, properly stating the uh, audacious vision that PTFI <laughs> is seeking to bring, it is critically important, and 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 it's amazing that the Rockefeller fam, uh, Foundation has really stepped up to provide the resources for that initiative. It is so critical and so important. Um, the the key challenge that they're facing in the standardization of the equipment, the methodologies, also involves a lot of PhDs that don't exist, a lot of labs that aren't functioning and standardized. It is, um, we run our own lab with a few PhDs, with our own equipment, with an LCMS. Like I, I now fully appreciate the task that PTFI is taking on to try and standardize these measurements across the system. At Audacious, our view is that, um, that's a critically important and their ability to measure the millions of compounds in food that are currently unmapped is is important and a public good that needs to exist our logic is okay there's 150 to 200 compounds that we can see quickly and cheaply that are critically important to human health that we can uh drive down the cost of measurement uh for those compounds so that we eventually have these two databases, which is, you know, the full molecular composition of food on millions of compounds. But, you know, you for a few dollars a sample, you can get, you know, 150 compounds very accurately of what's inside your food. And yeah. before I keep going, I'm just curious, Paul, what did that study cost you to run? 30 grand. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that just gives you a second, like, who can do that? Right. And so, Public good, Rockefeller stepping in to do a job the government should have been doing for a long time to map nutrition and talk about what's in our food system. That's what PTFI is doing. 
we're trying to provide tools today into the food system to help people understand the relative quality based on the nutrient composition of the food. And um, so, yeah, that's that's what we do and, and so grateful for what ETFI is doing. But I see a quicker path to help getting this information in the market, which is what we're working on. Yeah. So just to maybe put a, be a little bit more specific, I mean, the, the tools that you guys are building are, are allowing for just a much, I mean, what's, what's the, what's the degree of magnitude cost reduction that you guys are, are proposing to, to allow for? Yeah. So a thousand X basically. So um, if you want to do the study that Paul did, it runs, you know, it can run from 1500 to $3,500 per sample, depending on the granularity that you want to look at. Yeah. Um, to have any number of samples, you again, you're in 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars easily, and no producer is going to do. Who's going to do that? And who's going to have the granularity to understand the variability in the system? Yeah. Um, so we use a combination of instruments that overlap to the electromagnetic spectrum, and uh, we combine them in novel ways and allow us to see a, a, a really good in-depth profile of what's inside the food and. All we're really doing is building spectral libraries. So the same chromatograph that's generated by an LCMS or an LC time of flight LCMS, which, which their PTFI is standardizing on, uh, we're generating a same chromatograph that tells you what's spectroscopically happening when you hit the light, uh, hit the sample with some piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. And mm -hmm. what we do is we build nutritional profiles based on that technology hit examples to say, can we accurately predict what's inside food? And the answer overwhelmingly for, again, for 150 compounds, 150, 200 compounds is yes, we're going to be able to tell you. But what's that list that Paul put out, that, that in-depth list, that's going to be a lot more challenging. And that's going to be, you're going to need PTFI to, to make that a possibility. Is what, that happens, what needs to happen after PTFI is the government has to start funding health studies to actually understand the importance right. of those compounds in the diet, which again, if, you know, if Dariush is successful in having the National Institute of Nutrition, maybe we'll actually get to the point where we can do those studies, but that's still, you know, years away. Yeah. Is there ultimately a way in which the data generated by PTFI would serve your work at Edacious? Do you view them as sort of separate entities covering different levels of granularity in this system or is once they start coming out with data, is that something that Edacious could use effectively in your product? It's about those spectral libraries, right? So yeah. if Bruce runs milk samples in his lab and he sees chromatograph for this profile of milk with these nutrients, and then Edacious does it very cheaply with its spectroscopic instrumentation, uh, it's about machine learning algorithms that can link those signals together and say, can we get a rough profile and a good signal from very expensive mechanisms. And, and that's how our company works. We have to do the same measurements that that Bruce yeah. and Paul are doing to be able to drive down the cost of the spectroscopy. Yeah, okay, awesome. Well, um, yeah, I, I would, please, oh, please, Bruce. No, I was just gonna say, they're wonderfully complimentary. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and to, to, to wax it again on the, on the Google Maps metaphor, the public database tells you what the roads are uh, where they connect, uh, it has to be in place. But then real time measurement is is the value. So the the maps aren't telling you what the traffic is, but it's critical to know what the traffic is. So the Dacius is giving real time value uh, to to make the utility of the database uh, mm. valuable. So I I view them as wonderfully complementary. Uh, you need both. Yeah, I definitely agree. So uh, we're coming we're coming to the last slide here, and um, it, it touches on something that we covered briefly at the beginning, or that Paul made a comment on about like what do I like what do I do with this information? Like who who's going to use it? Like how who's going to care about it? Who's going to pay more money for it? Um, I want to I want to hear everyone's perspective here, but you know, Eric, I think given how many customers you're talking to, I think it would be great to just get the diversity of like what people care about. Um, I think. So the way the way I framed this, I, I know there's more stakeholders, but I sort of view it sort of three big buckets. There being producers, um, these could be groups like Pasture Bird or someone like White Oak Pastures, who's done a really good job of like commercial, like building messaging around sustainability and nutrition in their beef products. Um, 
in, in terms of being able to leverage that information at a lower cost in their messaging. Uh, then I think you also have the consumer, which I think is probably the most important piece here, because in the end, they're the ones who are buying these products. Like it, it, like producers can care about it. CPGs can care about it. But ultimately, you have to have consumers who put value on some quality attributable to the nutrition of the product. So I think that's an area that we need to hone in more on uh, in this last section. But I think also CPGs thinking about, you know, as this sort of food and health message grows and becomes more meaningful in the general population, how can they build a competitive advantage with products that likely work with key producers who have verifiable nutritional differentiation that's proven over a long period of time or proven using their production methods? That could be a very interesting way for them to differentiate. So those are some of the initial buckets that I've thought about. But but Eric, can you, can you give us some examples of ways in which your, your customers are thinking about how they might leverage this information for some business purpose, whether it's serving the consumer, whether it's serving their um, their ESG goals, et cetera? Yeah, um, I'll give you a quick overview of how we're approaching this. Um, on the production side, you know, even if you tell someone what the nutritional composition of their food is, they need tools to do something with it, that translation piece. That's, that's a key problem. It's great to also tell them how they're performing and be able to benchmark the results. But if you can't tell them why they got those results, uh, and again, the genetics, environmental conditions, and management practices, it's only half useful to that producer. And that's where we, you know, and our part of our mission is to serve producers to basically dis you know, return power to the ends of the food system and take it out of the middle. And so producers need better tools to say, I'm doing something right, you should pay me for it. And that's nutrition, that's data. When you look at the producer consumer problem set, it's what Paul said, it's the translation. And that's why it's so relevant that we started this conversation of how you define nutrient density. Because if you don't have quick signals and scores and grades to actually make good decisions, um, you're going to get lost in noise, which is what we currently have. And like we're working on our own concepts because we have to, and we have to have things that we can share with our customers. But we would rather be doing this in a working group with public groups to say, this is an acceptable definition for nutrient density and, and we can all agree on that. And it's no one's label. It's a piece of information that's it's publicly that's been verified in real time by hopefully our technology to say that, uh, honestly. But um, so consumers need the ability to make quick decisions. Um, the CPG challenge is, is all about verification. And this goes back to the nutritional label. There's no frequency of sampling. There's no requirement on the number of samples. There's no, it is wild west in terms of how nutritional facts panels get produced and how this information gets compared. Most people use calculators. They enter a few data points and a calculator generates it for them. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, and then, like you said, plus or minus 20% of the nutritional facts panel is widely accepted, but the FDA doesn't, no one's auditing nutritional facts panels. So you don't even know if you're if our results are telling us you're not even getting what it says on the nutritional facts panel to mm -hmm. begin with. So you're getting cheated there. It's just like, so um, for us, low cost measurement unlocks that real time, you know, view and being able to see the traffic and be able to understand the flows of nutrients in the systems. So that's why we're really focused on driving down the cost so that, um, you know, this information can make its way into the public space. Yeah. Does that give did that give you any any thoughts, Paul, in terms of how you might think about using this type of information? What type of meaningful advantage you think it could give you? How long you think it would take to to get this message out to a to a broader consumer? How, how does this ultimately play into your guys' goals? Yeah, I mean, just a couple of thoughts on that. So I, I do think we've treated consumers like they're stupider um, than they than they actually are. I think uh, there's a level of respect that we need to have as marketers. For the type of consumer that's going to pay more for a nutrient dense product, um, they want more information. They do like the data. I've seen, you know, maybe it doesn't live on the front of the pack in retail, but it can live on the website and it can live on social media. And I mean, when I post stuff like this, it does really well. It gets a lot of traction. So it's not that people don't care. And yeah, I do think there's a need to like get it down to a really quick and simple kind of definition, maybe for on pack, but I don't think we should shy away from giving them. Um, them being the consumers, some more of that kind of hefty data to, to go and chew on and read some white papers because 
you know, you're always kind of selling to the early adopters um, who are then going to go and, um, and sell the product for you. So I think that those early adopters are really going to um, be willing to dig in. Just another thing on consumers, you know, the, the original uh, mass spectrometer kind of nutrient density test has been in R&D for a few million years. And I always say that's the four-year-old test. So you can also go feed, you know, feed product to a four-year-old and get their feedback because they're very unbiased and very opinionated. And uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll tell you if it was good or not. You know, that doesn't always work because if it's very sugary or something like that, you're going to get biased data. But um, with, a, with a whole nutrient dense kind of raw, real food, um, the holy grail is going to be when we can link flavor to nutrient density. And I'm sure Bruce and Eric would be able to comment on some of that work that's probably being done already. But once we can figure out what, from a nutrient density perspective, what makes it taste good and really taste different, then that's the huge unlock because people will pay more for food that tastes better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking at the clock here, I want to make sure we save some time for questions from the audience. I know that we have a couple that have filled in already. I imagine we might get a couple more. Um, so uh, just jumping into that, again, if you have any questions for any of our speakers today, um, feel free to type your question directly um, in the question box and I'll answer them in the order that they're received. Um, I'll ask this question and see if... Um, well, it depends on whether you guys have read this book or not. So if, if not, we'll, we can move on to the next one. Um, the first question is, what do you think about Mark Hyman's proposals in his book, The Food Fix? Has anybody read The Food Fix? Not in enough detail to comment. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I'd be curious what the, uh, what the question asked her, if there's a specific one. He recommended a lot of different things. One of the standouts to me was trying to get land into the hands of land managers that are going to manage in a more regenerative way and produce more nutrient dense food. That's a very complex one, probably not one that, that can take like a 30 second answer. So, gotcha. okay. Um, well, Tom, if you want to be more specific in your question about some of those proposals, feel free to um, type those um, in the box. Um, this second question, I believe, is for, um, for Bruce. Um, how long will it take to fill out the periodic table of foods, or at least the first thousand that you guys alluded to, is there a way for the public to track the progress of which foods and what regions have been measured and which are planned to be? Oh, and that's a great question. Great and, question. And that's exactly, <laughs> yeah, why they should go on the periodic table of foods initiative website, because it, it, it's looking to be a very public and very transparent process. Um, the thought was that by the end of 2024, the methodologies would be ready and start. Um, we're well over a year ahead of that schedule. So the methodologies are already being applied. Uh, the first 100 foods are, are, are being posted. The, the scale up is expansive. So you can expect the next thousand uh, to be very few months in the future. Um, and the more laboratories around the world that can do this, the, the faster it will accelerate we're basically doing is, is providing the means for the agriculture and food enterprise to become a knowledge-based system. Mm. That will literally change everything. Thanks, Bruce. Um, a question here from, uh, from Rob Lustig that um, I imagine some of you may agree with, but you also may disagree with. Um, so I guess that makes it a good question. Um, uh, the problem, there's a problem that flavonoids, polyphenols, and other micronutrients, they, they don't taste that good. Um, and that's why they were bred out in the first place. And that's why sugar was added. Um, any thoughts on how to fix that problem or any or any potential disagreements with that statement? Hey, what the hell, Rob Lustig? That's not true. <laughs> that's not why they were bred out. That has little to do with why they were bred out. I, I, I don't know that I disagree. Uh, I, I mean, I agree. So first off, uh, if you haven't read his Robert Bob's book, uh, uh, it's called Metabolical, and it is fantastic, and you should definitely read it. Um, but I, I think once, Rob, you take sugar out of the diet, taste buds have an ability to reformulate pretty quick, and then bitter things actually become good again. And so I think the first is just policy to remove sugar from the, from the food system, which is, you know, uh, we need more of that.
Um, there's, I think we're pretty much out of time here for further questions. Um, there is one sort of more of a comment um, that's around wanting to form a, um, a Senate Ag Committee focused on this topic um, for the for the next farm bill negotiations. Um, uh, Michael, uh, why don't you follow up with with us over email after this, and I can figure out how to get you in touch with um, with some of our speakers. Um, look, before we drop off here today, um, opportunity to plug any of the work you guys are working on. Paul, Eric, Bruce, any any final thoughts you guys wanna wanna leave us with? Any and and, and any ways in which the audience can help you guys out? I'll just end by saying, as a producer, you know, representing kind of land and, and products, I'm really excited about what Eric and Bruce are both working on. I think it has a chance to really change the game um, for people like me that are trying to raise these types of foods. So kudos to you guys. Thanks, Paul. We're um, we're we're looking for customers. So if you are working in grains, uh, meat, or milk, um, and we started with animal products, actually and grains because um, the variability is well understood. Uh, it requires on-label packaging already, um, and there's very different outcomes in those systems. So um, we're, we're uh, kind of open for pilot customers to come and work with us. So feel free to reach out. Thanks, Eric. Bruce, anything you want, you want to throw in the mix? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, the most important diet in your life is your first one. Um, we need to help mothers and babies, full stop. Everyone should be actively engaged in making sure every mother is well nourished and every baby equally so. Awesome, thanks, Bruce. Well, um, uh, Eric, Bruce, Paul, we sincerely appreciate your guys' time today, your insights, uh, really happy with the way that sort of diversity of perspectives came together um, on this panel today. Um, for anybody listening um, or who participated in the, in the discussion, either actively or listening, um, thank you so much for being a part of this. This is an important part of our mission towards driving towards more sustainable, more nutritious food system. Um, and each of the people we've had on the call today are playing a really critical role um, in serving that mission. Um, this uh, recording will be emailed to you um, if you registered, um, and it will also be available on YouTube um, for anybody uh, who wants to watch it there. Um, lastly, I'll mention if you want a copy of this presentation, um, you can reach out to our team at iSelect, uh, and I'm happy to send you a copy of the PDF. Um, otherwise, thank you all for your time, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, guys.